the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The Kyrie today will be spoken. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. With the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. steadfast confidence in your loving kindness and mercy. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
We'll now have our readings. Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 and 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 67 responsively. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad to sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, 13 through 15, and 28 through 32. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. Now I am speaking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? As regards to the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that they, that by the mercy shown to you, they may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to be disobedient, that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> St. Matthew in the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, Is it not right? It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, She, she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated for him 611. 611.
looking at the first service that this is a very unique gospel message. This is a verse that I think everyone needs to hear and to kind of read and to, uh, to digest many, many times. But it's special for me for a couple of reasons. I can remember the last time I was in this pulpit talking about this gospel message. And the reason that is really kind of special to me is that means I've been here for a while that we've gone all the way through the lectionary. Uh, we did a uh, the one-year lectionary and the three-year lectionary, and I'm still here, so that's good. Now, last time we did have a, um, a Sunday school in which we were able to really go into this in depth. Today we don't have that, but that's okay. We will talk about it as best as possible. So... Jesus encounters a Canaanite woman, and this encounter at first can seem somewhat unsettling. Jesus is, seems less than eager to help this woman. At first, it seems as though he's explaining that his mission is first to the house of Israel. However, Jesus is the one who has left the Jewish territory and has found this woman, and is in this woman's world, as it were. Furthermore, this Canaanite woman, an unclean outsider, demonstrates that she has a better grasp of Jesus' identity than the hand-selected Jewish disciples do at this point in the narrative. Jesus' encounter with the Canaanite woman unsettles boundaries and calls into questions the very definitions of clean versus unclean, and he will confront them head-on with the Sadducees and the Pharisees momentarily. You see, Jesus has entered into this region where the Canaanite woman instantly greets him. It is remarkable that enough word about Jesus had spread to this region that the woman would somehow know who Jesus is. We see that happen in Mark 3.8. The text does not say that he has performed any signs yet before the woman has greeted him. And yet she somehow recognizes him, not just as a roaming healer, but as a rightful king. This is very important to the story. This the woman greets Jesus, and as she greets him, she says, Son of David. Her recognition is all the more remarkable because the disciples have still been a bit slow to recognize Jesus. In Matthew 14, which we talked about last week, after walking on the sea, they do recognize Jesus as the Son of God, but it's not until 16.6 that Peter finally declares that Jesus is the Messiah. But this woman, referring to being the son of David, is declaring exactly that very thing. This woman hails Jesus as the son of David, begs his mercy, and entreats his power over a demon that has severely possessed her daughter. How is it possible that this woman has more insight into Jesus' identity than it seems even the disciples? She is, after all, an unclean outsider, part of a people who are remembered as an old enemy of Israel. At this point, sometimes I feel as though what I would call the true church, the apostolic church, the last remnant of the church, those who hold true to the very foundations of Scripture, those who profess confessional Christianity, the confessional cross, the understanding that we are sinners, and without Christ, we are nothing. Sometimes I feel like we are the woman, the outside, unclean person, that the rest of the world and the rest of the church chastises and said, send them away. They make us feel all icky. They keep talking about forgiveness and sins and these things that we like to do, but they, they say we can't. Jesus' response is perhaps perplexing at first until we fully grasp the context in all he says. At first, he does not say a word to her. He seemingly ignores her. But he does refuse to send her away. 
only after her presence does not converse with her. Twice he explains to her that, does she even think that he's there for her? Indeed, the narrative has emphasized the house of Israel. But Jesus is making a point here. A point that he hopes not only the disciples will see, but those Pharisees that keep trailing him will see as well. He has provided, he has gone on, Jesus, he says, explains to her that the mission is first the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Indeed, the narrative has emphasized the house of Israel and that has provided Jesus with what seems to be more work than one laborer could feasibly handle. The need for Israel is indeed great, but Israel is not the reason God came. God came for the world. The disciples, too, seem to think that Jesus should stay focused on their, their own needs. Jesus, us, remember us, even at the feeding, remember at the feeding, they send them away. The disciples are quick to say that. Send them away. We have fun things we want to talk about. Let me tell you about it. We want to pat on the back, Jesus. And Jesus always stays focused. He kept telling her to send her away because they are tired of hearing her cries for help. Perhaps Jesus' refusal to listen to the disciples gave the woman hope that her requests might be heard. She does something that is utterly significant next in this very passage of the gospel. She kneels before him. Now the author of Matthew uses this action as one befitting a king. The Magi, who are also Gentiles like her, are the first to offer their worship in this style. In Matthew 2, 2, 8, and 11. Remember the unrepentant slave bows before the king in the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, and the mother of James and John kneel before Jesus as a king of a kingdom in Matthew 20, 20. For the woman to treat Jesus in this manner is in keeping with her earlier declaration that Jesus is the son of David. She is making a bold claim that even the disciples to this point are not willing to make. You are not just sovereign, but you have sovereignty over the demons. And more importantly, you have sovereignty over me. You are my king. Kneeling is not only a sign of kingship, but also a recognition of power. There is a connection between those who kneel before Jesus and the healing that Jesus performs. Remember that the leper kneels before Jesus and asks to be made clean. Matthew 8, 2. The ruler kneels and asks for his daughter's healing. In 9, 18, at the very end of the gospel, when the resurrection of the Lord appears, the disciples finally bow before him. And Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth are his. And 28, 17 through 18, bowing in worship also recalls Jesus' command to worship only the Lord God in 4, 9. This woman kneels before the womb, the one whom she recognizes as having authority not only to sit on the throne of David, but to wield power over evil and big enough and strong enough to be her very own king. Jesus' response to her second cry for help includes a reiteration of his mission to the lost sheep. You think that he's specifically talking to her, but it's not. He's speaking to the room. He wants the Pharisees to hear what he has to say. He likens her status as a Gentile to the status of a small pet dog who longs to be fed from the table. And I can imagine the Pharisees off in the corner smiling and stroking their beards and ingredients. The woman, however, is not deterred because she understands her relationship to a king as a servant and she is there to serve him, not the other way around. She is not deterred. She claims a place in the household, but it is not a position of power or even a position of an insider. She accepts the status of a dog by claiming that even a dog enjoys the crumbs from the master's table. Her statement is striking. She places hope in what others have discarded and I can imagine right then a small smile creeping across Jesus' face as he understands that while she is the only one in the room who fully understands what's going on 
in that very moment. She gets it. An arrow to the heart. This, the son of David, has so much power that there is enough power for the house of Israel and more than enough left over for her. She is not trying to thwart his mission. She just wants a crumb, recognizing that even a crumb is powerful enough to defeat the demon that has possessed her daughter. And the Pharisees who think they can stamp him out and crush his head like a serpent are well misguided because he's not only there for Israel, but there to save the world around them. He understands the power wielded from Rome. He knows what will eventually happen in Rome pushing them out. And he knows that it will be Rome who will spread his message in the Byzantine Empire to the rest of the world. The Pharisees are too small-minded to know exactly what's in front of them. Jesus praises her faith. This woman seems to understand what the members of the household of Israel have yet to grasp. Jesus is not just the hope of Israel, but the hope of the world. He is the true completion of the Jewish faith. He's not a separation from it. He is the proclamation. He is the, the actual events of the prophecies that the Messiah would make all whole. She gets it, while others don't. In the passage that immediately precedes this story, we see the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would like to say. Jesus responds to the challenges of the scribes and the Pharisees by reframing the boundaries of the clean and the unclean in 1518. Jesus declares that what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and what comes from the heart determine what makes one clean. What comes out of the Canaanite woman's heart is faith servanthood, confession, repentance, love, and obedience. Certainly, she knows that Jesus has enough power for Israel and power enough to save her non-Israelite daughter. That's where we find ourselves today, in a very scary and unsettling time to be sure, but just because Jesus doesn't answer us when we cry doesn't mean he's not sitting there listening. Jesus is not a genie in a bottle. We can rub it and ask for three wishes and get what we want. Jesus is the true, completely encompassing, understanding idea of love. There was never a point in which Jesus was not going to heal this woman's daughter. There was a point in which Jesus was going to show her his true, actual love. Sometimes we sit at the table and we think we sit next to, or as Peter wanted to, to kind of proclaim, he would be sitting at the right hand of Jesus. Even Peter doesn't get it until after the death and resurrection when he's ready to fall down on his faith. But sometimes we laugh at Peter, but it is you and I who think we sit neck and neck at the table with Christ. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is our King. Yes, he is also our Savior and our Shepherd. And he says he will come and find us. But make no mistake, he has the power enough to destroy the enemy. And he is our very King. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Jesus is God, our Creator. If we are ready to have a conversation with God or with Jesus, such as Job did, then we must be ready to have a response such as Job got. Far too often, we find ourselves in too much grandeur of our own status, which I think is the problem with most of the church today. The gall to think that they can decide what is and what is not sin, who did and who did not create the earth, what is and what is not the word of God. I promise you Jesus is sitting there smiling, understanding that he is the sovereign king and no one gets to make the determination except for him. And these churches who think they are so important and so intelligent are like the Pharisees sitting off in the corner, stroking their beards, thinking that Jesus is in complete agreement with them, not because of what their heart wants, but because what they want people to think their heart wants. Remember that intent is always 
before content. You can fool a lot of people in this world with your content or what would people see, but the intent behind it, what your heart actually longs for, can never be hidden from Christ. And what everyone in that room failed to realize in that moment was that Jesus knew the inside of every one of their hearts, and it was the woman, the outsider, those who they thought were unclean, that was actually the clean one. Everyone else was found to be unclean. Jesus calls them out for that. Out of their heart will they be found unclean. You are unclean, not her. So there's good news in this. For all of you who think, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough to be a servant of Christ. Well, neither was the woman at the well. She became the first missionary ever in Christianity. Neither was this Canaanite woman who crawls to the table of Jesus, but not only was her wish granted not only was her woman or her daughter healed but she gets a status higher than those of the pharisees we see even rulers that understand to bow before him because jesus is the ultimate king he makes the statement of king of king and lord of lord no one shall come to the father except through me why is that because he is one and of the father the trinity is all encompassing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and three, three and one. The only way to get to the Father is to do what? Go to the Father through the Son. There are no mistakes or back doors or shortcuts. The only way to the Father is through him. Jesus is the word. Jesus not only knows us for our heart, but he's willing to be our king. This is the most important part of the story. Not only is Jesus God, and the beginning was the word, not only is he our creator, but he is willing to be our king. The power that that has when we bow before our God and king and we treat him as such. The rest of the world is confused and shaky. They don't know what's coming next or what's behind them. The governments of the world will continue to let them down Everything in this world seems to be unsure, but for you and I, we do have a sovereign king that we bow before, and everything is in his control. So we can put our minds at ease, because we don't have to know what's coming next. We don't have to be in control of what's happening around us, because our God and king, who has power over the enemy and power over us, has enough power to hold us firmly in his hands and bring us to the loving care of God our Father. May the peace that passes all understanding be in your heart and mind. Amen. Well, we continue with our third hymn of the day, which is 633. We will only be singing verses 1 through 4, or excuse me, 1 through 3 and 6. 1 through 3 and 6.